welcome back to my Roman kitchen. The last time we gave you a film, I promised a special film just about Roman fish sauce. And it's taken me a long time to get to this stage. I've had to accumulate lots of different ingredients and also make fish sauce for you to see and look at. So we're gonna get up close and personal with, with some Lequaman today. This on the right here is mackerel. I wanted sardine. Sardine would have been ideal in the recipes, but I can't can't get it here. So mackerel actually makes the finest fish sauce, according to Pliny. And I took about eight kilos of mackerel. I cut them open uh, just to allow the salt to penetrate inside the viscera, in amongst the viscera. And I added about a kilo of salt. So it's eight to one fish to salt by volume. So it smells fabulous, I have to tell you divine smell. Rod, come on, stick your nose in here and tell me it's divine. Mm -hmm. My goodness, that's very fishy. <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculously fishy. Now, this, I, I did this three months ago. So this is now the first harvest of sauce that's come off this tank. So here is what's remaining of the fish with more brining. So you can see there's not a huge amount that's dissolved yet. The skin is gone. I noticed that with my first experiments for fish sauce, that the, the fish um, take a long time to, to dissolve when they're this big. Uh, they start to go pink and white and they shed their flesh and they shed their flesh into particles. And you can see what the particles are like. You can actually see the size of them here. They're quite thick, quite big and the sauce forms underneath. So this batch here has got extra brine in it and I'm continuing to ferment. Now, I actually added a little extra viscera to this just to aid the digestion process. And this is because the enzymes in the viscera of any kind of fish will help to dissolve the flesh itself. As that is the muscle tissue. So let me find another piece. You see, look, very little has been shed and yet that's all muscle tissue in particle form. So let us look back now. Let's take, get that out after having stirred it. Let's look back at the original recipes and I'll read them out to you. This is where I started. I'm going to be reading the recipes from my own book, The Story of Garum, Fermented Fish Sauce and Salted Fish in the Ancient World. I do not expect you. To buy this. This is eye-poppingly expensive from Routledge, but it was my life's work because I looked at fish sauce from every conceivable angle. So we're going to read the Geoponica. The Geoponica is a Byzantine recipe collection, a farming manual in fact, but it contains material from right across the Roman world and in fact it contains a lot of early Greek material and that's what this recipe is. So to make gara, the plural of garum, or garros, in fact, in Greek. The so-called liquamen is made thus. Fish entrails are put in a container and salted, and then little fish, especially sand smelt, or red mullet, or pickerel, or anchovy, or any small enough, are all similarly salted and left to pickle in the sun, stirring frequently. When the heat has pickled them, the garros is got from them thus. A deep, close woven basket is inserted into the center of the vessel containing the fish and the garros flows into the basket. Thus then it is how liquamen is obtained by filtering through the basket the residue makes alec. Now the residue is what's in the bottom of this and so alec could be, can be, leftover fish undissolved that you can then rebrine to make more sauce. That is how it works. We know the residue is rebrined from our archaeological evidence. So the Bithynians make it thus, a different recipe. Take preferably small or large pickerel, or if non, anchovy or scad or mackerel, and also alec, i.e. some of this. You add some of the leftover from the last batch of fish sauce to the fresh batch, and a mixture of all of these, and put them into a baker's bowl. That's the kind of thing you need bread in. And then you add one modius of fish to six Italian pints of salt. That's the eight to one ratio that we know about. And mix it well with the fish and leave it overnight. 
and then put it into an earthen vessel and leave it uncovered in the sun for two to three months. Uncovered. That means uh, any fluid that is generated, i.e. The, the brine that is formed when you salt fish, can evaporate. So you have to keep topping it up. I, I noticed this when I made my fish sauce. Occasionally stirring with a stick, then take the fluid, cover and store. Some add two pints of old wine to each pint of fish. That is that pint of a fish by volume of pieces or is it a pint of this, i.e. the liquor that comes off it? Do you then take your first flush of fish sauce off and blend that with two pints of wine? Very difficult to tell. Or do you add the wine in to counteract the evaporation? Again, not sure. Then of course he says, they say, if you want to use garum at once, and that is not by aging it in the sun, but by cooking it, you just put pure brine and fish together and you boil it up and you make something that doesn't really resemble fish sauce at all, but it will do if in a hurry if you need it. And then of course, the very last part of this recipe talks about the garros, which is called hymation, hymation, and that means bloody. And this is tuna entrails with gills, fluid and blood, sprinkle with sufficient salt, leave it in a vessel for two months at the most, then pierce the jar and the garros or the hymation flows out from underneath. And you can see actually what happens is that the fluid that you want, the desirable source forms at the bottom anyway. So if you have a ceramic jar, you pierce the bottom, you get the fine dark liquor that you want from your bloody fish sauce and all the residue, which is basically undigested fish viscera, stays in the jar, which you don't want it. I ha have a colleague who tried to consume semi-digested fish viscera just as an experiment. I didn't want to. I, I never thought it would be fit, fit for consumption, but he did. And he tried to generate a second source from it. And he said it was bitter and unpleasant. So the residue from making the bloody garum is not rebrined, but the residue from making uh, liquamen clearly is. And that's the key. And this, in fact, from the size of those pieces of fish, I think we can get three batches of fish sauce from the same batch of fish, which is hugely important because it means vast increase in the volume of fish sauce that the ancients were making and trading, which is really exciting. So there is one other recipe that survives, uh, again, from a, a Byzantine text. It's purported to be a guy from uh, a writer called Gargilius Martialis, uh, but it, we don't believe he actually wrote it. Uh, and it, it is again a, um, it's, it's late, almost early medieval recipe. And it says, for making liquamen, naturally oily fishes are caught and taken, such as salmon, eels, shad, sardine or herring. An arrangement of the following kind is made from them, along with dried fragrant herbs and salt. They are put together with the fragrant dry herbs and salt in this way. A good sturdy vessel, well pitched, with a capacity of three or four modii, it's got ready and dried herbs with a good fragrance are taken. These can be from, from garden or field herbs, namely dill, coriander, fennel, celery, uh, rue, mint, thyme, lovage, pennyroyal, oregano, the list goes on. A first layer is spread out at the bottom of the vessel using these. Then the second layer is laid down using fish, whole if they are small, cut up if they are larger. My naughty dog is causing trouble. Chris, can you call him? <laughs> Over this is added the third layer of salt, two fingers deep. That, if you can imagine, on top of a fish is quite a deep layer of salt. And the vessel is to be filled right to the top with a succession of triple layers of herbs, fish and salt. It should then be closed up with a fitted lid and put aside for seven days. When the seven days are over, the mixture should be stirred right to the bottom using a wooden paddle twice or three times a day. When this process is complete, the liquor, which is flows out, is collected. Now, it doesn't give us a time span. This is three months, the one I used, and the, from the earlier recipe. So it seems very short 
for this method and it's also as you've seen from the level of salt and the amount of herbs a very dry mixture and it's not easy to stir and the yield of sauce from it is very low relatively low compared with this method of making it so but then a liquamen is taken and i think most of the fish is like this it's still semi uh, it's intact it hasn't lost its integrity and they would have rebrined it but that doesn't is not mentioned in, in the recipe at all so they are the two ways of doing it enclosed with no extra liquid lots more salt and dry herbs or open to the sun with additional fluid and in each case they are rebrined that's that's for sure because you cannot actually dissolve all the fish in the brine that is generated by that fish that's the key now i have actually followed the open to the sun method but i've kept it enclosed and i've also added extra liquid so i've used a combination of the two and i haven't added herbs because i think herbs should be added later when they are uh, when the when this sauce is actually used to make oin agarum, which is what we're going to be using. So let us have a look now at our harvested sauce. So, as you can see, there's quite a lot of oil. There was quite a lot of oil on this, but there's also quite a lot of oil on, on the top of this. And it's, it's indicating that not only, you can see how thick that is too, that residue. It's like a, a thick anchovy paste. But the smell is good. The smell is actually very, very good. So what it tells us, the oil, is that it is still continuing to dissolve. One of the experiments I conducted much earlier was to take a batch of this, what we call floss sauce, stir it and transfer it from one container to another and then estimate or rejudge how how much of the alec the, the paste is there and it, it continues to to dissolve all the time and in fact the paste gets thinner and thinner and more and more liquid is formed so i'm going to be stirring it up blending it up and taking out a really good smell so i think from the archaeological evidence, it is fairly clear to me at least that fish sauce was traded in this state. It wasn't, it wasn't traded clear and fine like we find with our bottles down here. So I think the Romans would, would trade it like this and the cork would pass it through a sieve to harvest the fine shiny, dark, crystal clear liquid. And it may have been filtered two or three times because I can see that coming through. I've got four layers of muslin and I can see it's still a touch cloudy compared with our, with our crystal clear sources over there. So we're going to leave that to filter and we're going to, for the first time, taste this because I've not tasted it yet. heavens to melt for you. It's intensely um, proteiny, meaty, not fishy, very light in salt. I know it's light in salt because um, eight to one roughly corresponds to about 12% salt. Most fish sauce in Thailand and Vietnam is made at at least 25 to 30% salt. So we know that taste of Thai fish sauce. It's beautiful. I'm very pleased. It's going to make some really, really quite delicious oinigaram. And the point about ancient fish sauce, as opposed to all the modern kinds, is that the low salt means that you can use it in bulk. And an oinigaram sometimes actually specifically calls for equal quantities of wine and fish sauce and an oil and vinegar um, 
and if you if you if you use um, modern fish sauce or even these kinds of fish sauces here they're too salty and it makes for a very very unpleasant comment well it's not that unpleasant it's not as good as it can be with this this is the key very very low salt here's a selection of what is available commercially online uh, at a considerable expense I should say but before we describe these, I just wanted to show you this. This has been, this has got a sell-by date of about 2007, so we never opened it. But it's, this is called Ground Preserved Fish, and it's anchovy. Now, despite its age, notice that the fish paste is at the bottom and the liquor's at the top. And this is in stark contrast to what we've just seen with my fish sauce. And this is cleaned anchovy which means that each individual fish has had its head snapped off, its viscera taken out and discarded. And then the fish is washed, I think, probably washed in brine too, and then it's salted. And then it's turned into a paste. And this means that even though this is quite tasty, it's got umami, all the things that we want out of fish sauce, the protein levels are relatively low because all the protein remains in the paste which is heavy and sinks to the bottom. And we've seen with fish sauce that the reverse happens and that the paste always floats. And this is because the liquor itself is dense with dissolved protein, which means that the fish paste floats. So that's, I find that a fascinating example of how to explain the importance of viscera when making fish sauce. People think that's the, make, the thing that makes it horrible, but it's the, it's the issue that makes it superb and allows you to dissolve solid protein into a liquid form. Without it you cannot harvest the protein and the sauce is therefore it has umami, it has a fish taste and it has salt but it's not the same kind of delicious taste that I've just had from my fish sauce which I'm so pleased about. So let's work through these. Red boat used to be my favourite, not anymore I'm sorry but uh, it's very, very high in protein, 40 milligrams of nitrogen per litre of fish sauce. But that's so high in nutrition that it oxidises very rapidly. It gets darker and darker and darker. And this has been left out. You can see how dark it is. I mean, there's no light penetrating that at all. And it also gets quite pungent. And even though the salt levels are very low, they are 15%, uh, it's still too strong for an oiny garum. It's too strong for Roman food. So while I have in the past, I admit, said Red Boat is the best, it's no longer. And this is partly because there's so many other people making fish sauce now. So we're first off, we're dealing with the, with the genuine fish sauce. This is um, a garum made from sardines, uh, from the Sardo River and it's made by a restaurant called Can the Can and they started making fish sauce uh, using the sardines from the Sardo River in exactly the same way as the ancients did. They're using the same kind of recipes. They actually asked me for advice as to how to make it. So they take sardine and anchovy, they dissolve them together, they use low salt, they add extra wine. Their sauce is spectacular. It's as good as mine, I would say. Um, it's eye-wateringly expensive. You can probably spend a hundred pounds on a litre. Which is, if you want to use a lot of fish sauce, which I do, it, it, it mounts up. But it's, it, it's still an exceptional product and it, it, it's true to the ancient recipe. He makes uh, lots of different kinds of fish sauce. He makes it with sardine, he makes it with tuna. Um, and lots of other chefs around the world are fermenting fish in lots of different ways to make forms, versions of garum. Uh, and so they've moved away from the ancient idea of garum completely. But at Can the Can in Lisbon, it's still very much, when you buy the sardine uh, sauce, very, very good. So that's one of the ways to do it. The other way is to use coloratura di Irishi. Now these are made in the Bay of Naples, particularly at Katara, and they are um, 
fish sauces that are made in a particular way. Now, you, you remember I explained about how this was made. The individual uh, anchovies are eviscerated and deboned, and you made a paste. Well, this is exactly what happens with these sauces. There is no viscera in coloratura, so there is no protein harvest. And because the salt levels are frequently not measured, it's an artisanal product and they don't actually measure it beforehand, they sprinkle. And so it's not that clear what the ratio of fish to salt is. But basically, the original process was that you would, you would take anchovy, you would take the head, the viscera off, you would then wash that uh, piece of fish, those open fillets of, of anchovy in salt, and the first liquor to be extracted from that would be thrown away. They would then lay them in special containers with salt between, sprinkled salt between, and then it would be compressed. And then the liquor that came out, the coloratura, the filterings, was used as a flavoring ingredient in local cuisine. But the fish itself was consumed as anchovy, just slightly compressed, I've salted. And then over, over time, they started to change the way they made their coloratura because they saw that there was a market for it they decided to harvest as much as they could and that meant not consuming the anchovy as anchovy but compressing it and stirring it and allowing it to disintegrate and uh, taking as much liquor as they could and that's what we find here whether anybody makes coloratura the original way while still consuming the anchovy is impossible to tell i've tried to ask them and they won't respond um, it's quite possible that one of these is made the traditional way, but I doubt it. I think they are marketing it now as a form of ancient fish sauce, which is fine. This one is aged, made in 2017, and as you can see, compared with this one, it's considerably darker, um, and that's because it's oxidised, and there's higher protein levels, I suspect, in this one. I've not opened these, so I'm going to have a little taste. Again, the price of coloratura is anything from 60 to 150 pounds. <laughs> and this is on Amazon, of course. This is where I got my prices. I mean, obviously there are easy other ways to get it. This is coloratura from Katara, so the best place to get it. Katara was the was the little village where it was first made. Wonderful umami, one um, actually quite a decent protein kick, but way too salty. Couldn't possibly make an oinigan gallon with it. Uh, wow, it's pleasant, it's nice. Which one else shall we try? That's the palest. Let's have a look at this one as well. I'm very grateful to a number of colleagues who allowed me to accumulate all these sauces. They were sent from Italy, they were sent from Spain. Oh, again, oh, oh, too salty. Oh, the difference between mine and these is phenomenal. The final one we want to talk, talk about is Flor de Garam. This is from Cadiz. This is made using the Gargilius Martialis recipe precisely that recipe following it in detail so many herbs too much salt two fingers and um, a relatively short fermentation time according to amazon 400 pounds a litre <laughs> which is hilarious um, uh, but it is an ancient recipe and they follow it meticulously so i'm not knocking it it's a genuine ancient source but let's have a look. I haven't tasted it for a while. In it, uh, in the next section of the video, we're going to actually make some oinagara using three of these. So my sauce plus two, uh, prob probably flor de garum and one of the coloratoras, and then do a blind tasting and see if we can see which one's the best. Mm. Oh, that's a very, oh, that's nice actually. <laughs> You can taste the herbs very much you can taste the herbs i it's perfectly possible to her, put herbs in very nice not not too salty either 
I think since I last tested it, they have reduced the salt, which is very good news. Okay, so we have, mm, I've eaten a lot, from, a lot of fish sauce. It kind of, <laughs> you're not supposed to eat it on its own. This is the key. So this is my final one. This is a scarter. It's made in Barcelona by a wonderful chef called Pere, Pere Planaguma. I'm sorry, Pere, if I pronounced it wrong. I never could get it right. Now he, he's, he's been making fish sauce out of fish waste rather than fish meat. So he's taken uh, the bones of anchovy with viscera and fermented them. And it's an, uh, it's a different flavor because as we will see with our final sauce, if you just use viscera and salt, you get a very different flavor. You get a strong uh, um, taste of iron. And I think this, if, you're, if I remember rightly, you see how pale it is? It doesn't have, uh, I don't think it has the pr protein level. And it does taste of iron. It has that iron taste, which if you like it, it's great. If you want to taste the blood viscera garum, um, that's as strong as it gets. That's as close as it gets. Uh, because I know that he's used um, an anchovy viscera. Now, garum proper is made with mackerel or mullet viscera and blood, and lots of blood. The point is that it's made with harvested blood from large fish like tuna. Uh, and I have made that in the past, and it is an acquired taste, for sure. Uh, but this... This is called a shiri. It's a Japanese squid viscera sauce made with squid ink. So it's very different from black garum, but it has that strong, strong iron taste. Which, and I first tasted this and then I tasted my uh, black garum that I made with mackerel intestines and blood. I harvested the blood myself on the coast with the aid of some fishermen friends. I, I tasted this and I tasted mine and I thought they are very similar. It's the iron that makes it different because you don't get that with any of the fish sauces. <laughs> it does make you wince. Oh my God, it makes you wince. I need to... I've tasted an awful lot of fish sauce, more than I ever would want to normally. I'm going to go and get a drink now, cold water to rinse my mouth. And then we will make some more garum to taste these sauces as they should have been tasted in the ancient world you did not consume them neat it was not meant to be consumed neat um oh dear salty mouth <laughs> so we're going to try an oinigarum now through apicius there's many different versions of oinigarum but this is actually one of the most precise and it's making it's for a patina the um Gustum versatili, a turned out hors d'oeuvre. And it's basically like a, a frittata. But then at the end of it, it says, while it is cooking, while it is thickening, make an oinigarum for it like this. Pound pepper, lovage, pound again, pour on liquamen and wine. Flavor with passum or with sweet wine. One or the other. Blend in a little pan, put in a little oil, bring to heat when it's simmering, thicken the starch. So here's our thickened, just pepper and lovage flavoured sauce. So we're going to we're going to make it three times. I shall I shall demonstrate one, and then we'll we'll knock through the other two. So here's here's my lovage, which just needs to be allowed to. Whoa, that's got nice and hot. Good, it's a good sign. We want pepper. Always need pepper with these. When you go, a little handful. You want too much because it just gets too hot. You want the flavour rather than the heat. So while that's doing its thing, Oh, just a bit of 
that looks good. And that should be hot enough. We just need to bring the oils, bring the oils together. And then we keep on pounding. And then I'm not going to put my liquids in here. I'm just going to transfer them directly into the pan. And we're going to use this pan to heat it up. So it basically says, ah, I have, a, I have notes which are better. I took notes. So I want 60 ml each of wine and passum. 30 of fish sauce and 20 of oil. That's my rough estimate. So, straight wine. This is a, uh, a, a bottle of white wine we opened last night with our meal. I couldn't quite remember what it was called, but we won't, so we won't need to. Hey, look at that. Just what we need is nice hot water, hot, hot pan. So, then we want pasito now. Passum is that dessert wine that we always see in recipes and passito is the modern equivalent of passum in Italy and it's a sweet dessert wine, beautiful. So we've got, oops, doing it, don't do that, 60 of each. And then I'm going to use my fish sauce to start with and then we'll use we'll make some more so let's take that briefly out of there you can see how thick that paste is it stops the fluid coming out quite i think to remember when i was doing a lot of fish sauce a lot of filtering i'd, ha I'd have to leave it overnight to get all the liquor out so now we want 30 of my fish sauce. Now that will go back on, under the sieve. And a dab of oil, it says, just a little bit of oil. And then we add our seasonings. Now we just need to leave that to Get hot. Uh, um, oh dear, that was good cut. Dear, dear. Steady. That's a lot of pasito to lose. <laughs> so, and then we thicken it with amulum. Now, of course, amulum um, is not easy to acquire, <laughs> difficult to make. And I generally replace amulum with corn flour for convenience sake. Not authentic, but my my drinking water for the purposes of reducing the amount of salt in my mouth so we just need to make an emulsion that will cling to whatever we dip into it and i have cucumber and probably some lettuce from the garden that we can use to dip into this Kind of a tart for a tartar. I may add a few green herbs. I actually have a harvest, a fresh harvest of winter savoury from the garden, so I think I'm going to add that too. But we'll just see. I don't want it too thick. It makes needs a little longer to come to come to boil. Let's 
get some winter savoury. Give it a bit of herbiness. Not in the recipe, but I'm just adapting. Yeah. Whoops. Let's see. I want it a little thicker. Not quite come to heat yet. Once it starts to become a bit viscous. It's getting there. I'm going to taste it. Oh. oh yes, that'll do. That's bad news, I've tasted it and put the spoon back in the sauce, but naughty. I'll leave that for a minute and start the next one. We are back. I have made three versions of an oil garum. I have I have Chris with me. Chris is my husband, Chris. Chris Hello. Chris Grocock, who helped me write, or helped, we wrote together a Picius, and I'm sure mm. many of you know his name. I have made three versions of this Oinogaram, and that I know which is which, but nobody else does, and I want Chris to better taste them and tell me which is best. <laughs> I'd better get this right, haven't yeah, I? Had, yeah, don't no, dare pick the wrong one. <laughs> The point is, of course, you're very experienced of tasting oinigara, so you oh, know yeah. what they should taste like, but also what is wrong, if anything's wrong. Oh, them. well, you give you tasting notes and things. Give me tasting notes. Right. right. So, so I've kept them warm. Lovely. Entirely so proper. Help yourself with either your own homegrown lettuce. Thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for that. Or a piece of cucumber. Or a piece of homegrown cucumber. I think cucumber. And I'm going to have a piece of cucumber to clear whatever's on my palate to start with. That's a good idea, actually. Okay. Mm. Right. I've made a note of which bowl is which, but I have, for the purposes of this experiment, forgotten. <clears throat> All right, let's try that one that you just cut. They should really be labelled A, B, C, shouldn't they? No, I should. Mm, I'll put them in a line. All right, let's try it with some lettuce as well. Same one. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm. What do you think? Oh, hang it's on. Quite, it's got a... It's a very rich flavour, that one, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mmm. It comes through a lot more with the lettuce, maybe because you get more on it. Mmm. That's quite, got quite a kick, hasn't it? That's got a kick. It's almost peppery. Mmm. Um, There's a lot of pepper. A lot of, lot of salt coming through at the end as well. Right. Right, number two. Next one. Well, I'm going to do this. And your palate cleansing again. Oh, wow. Mm. Mm. That is... If we were doing a wine tasting, now this one is clinging to the side more than that one is. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably put a little bit more cling... Um, um, corn flour yeah. in it. More bland. Got more of a kick. Well, it, it, so far it is with the cucumber. Let's try it with the lettuce. Mm. It's hard to tell, isn't it? Has to yeah, be said. the pepper comes through with the lettuce because you get more of it. It has to be said, um, they are very similar. We haven't gone to this one yet, but they no. are, both of those are very similar. Mm. But that's slightly blander than that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a much more. Oh, what's the word? You were looking for umami. No, I'm thinking of it. It's much. It tastes much, much meatier. You know how with wow. different kinds of fish you get a different yeah. flavour. So you get the really white, nice white fish. Then you get to cod. Then you get to tuna. That's more tunery than that wow. one. Wow. Like I'm stuck for words. Wow. Hold on. You're being very good cleaning your palate. No. Oh, what's this in it? Dill. Oh, oh, yeah, there's winter savoury in all of them. Winter savoury in all just, of them. There's more to, bits in that one. Just to ring the changes. Ooh. 
there's a great deal more flavour to the other ingredients apart <coughs> from the fish sauce in that one. You can taste more <laughs> of the wine. You know what I mean? Excuse me. I'm going to smack my mouth. There we go. Oh, yeah. But the flavour is. Oh, you can. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. I'm being. um. Okay, of the three, I'd like that one best. <laughs> because yeah. more flavours come through. Of other things rather than fish. Yeah. And then I go with that one. Mm hmm. And this one, although this is much thicker, it clings, clings better. Um, mm -hmm. It was a slightly, uh, it was more, it was blander. But then, do you just say, well, we need what? need more of it? No, that one. That one. That was this one. This one is the. Mm. All right, which is which? Okay, this one is my fish sauce. Hey. Yay! And uh, this one is. Um, Coloratura. And this one is this one. Oh, that's from the Coloratura. Which one's that one? This is Florida Garum. Oh, is that's Florida Garum. This is the one from Cadiz. So that's one. That was a Florida yeah. Garum. Mm. Well, strange, isn't it? It is. This this has got quite a kick. This one. Yes, it has. Mm. But what you get is overpowering flavour from the fish sauce dominates in those two. But not in that one, um, no. With mine, which is lighter, so much lighter, um, there's still plenty of umami and it still gives you a lovely balance, but you don't, you get, it's not overpowering. And mm. overpowering is the problem that you've got to avoid with Roman food because it, there's so many other things going on and you want them to go on. Yeah, presumably if you end, ended up with a batch of fish sauce as a Roman chef 2,000 years ago and they were like the strong ones, you'd, put, you'd immediately put less in. I guess so, that's the key, yes, yes. Or is it, do you think, that well, there's we, something else in that in the fish sauce that you've made that, that allows the other flavours to go through, come you've through? You've not tasted it neat, and of course no, I, I, spent, I spent the last uh, half an hour or so uh, tasting it, tasting all these sauces neat. Mm. It is, I was really, really pleased with it. It's almost, oh goodness, yeah. It's almost sweet. It is, isn't it? I just thought you'd just put honey in there. No. There is wine. I, I, yeah, you've got sweet wine in, but no, no, no. Uh, uh, there's no sweet wine in this. There's only no. wine. When I made it, I added wine, as, the, added... Re as the recipe says. Oh, sorry, I'm confusing it with those. Yeah. No, no, yeah. So I, I am delighted with this. I think mm, it's absolutely great. special. Uh, Congrats. Yeah. Funny thing is, when you look at the when you look at the um, oh. the jar where it's made, oh. you really don't believe you something don't... as nice as that. Could, could come, come from, in from there. something yeah, I that know. looks so manky. Yes, yeah. it does look manky. Well, go for it. Okay, we're going to round up. Mm. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've had rather more fish sauce than I've had in a long time, and I need to have something else to counteract it. I tell you what, we're going to do. We're going to have some pasito. Right, mm. cameraman would like some too, I Absolutely. think. Absolutely. We're going to toast our my first batch of fish sauce ready for, cons no, my second batch, let's be honest, I've made it before. Mm. Um, first, first fish sauce since Covid. Since Covid, yes. Now, one of the things that happened over Covid was that I was asked to do a workshop on Roman food for some people who paid money to an auction to have that experience. So they were raising money for Classics for All, which is a society that tries to promote teaching Latin, Latin and Greek in state schools. Mm. So I, I donated my, my services. We had a great time with the people who, who paid up for, mm. that, for that service. It was wonderful. And I thought if anybody else would like to experience a workshop of Roman food here in the garden, please go to the website. Taste of the Ancient World, Sally Granger, and you can contact me and make a booking. Cheers. 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 Cheers.